Bunter was rather sensitive. He left her rather brusquely at the last. He got on board in good time and produced the usual impression on the mud pilot and the broken-down straw hat who took the sapphire out of dock. The river man was very polite to the dignified, striking-looking chief mate. The five-inch manila for the check rope, Mr. Bunter, thank you, Mr. Bunter, please. The sea pilot who left the gem of the ships, heading comfortably down channel off Dover, told some of his friends that this voyage, the Sapphire, had for chief mate a man who seemed a jolly good sight too good for old John's. Bunter's his name. I wonder where he sprung from. Never seen him before in any ship I piloted in or out all these years. He's the sort of man you don't forget. You couldn't. A thorough good sailor, too. And won't old John's just worry his head off, unless the old fool should take fright at him, for he does not seem the sort of man that would let himself be put upon without letting you know what he thinks of you. And that's exactly what old John's would be more afraid of than anything else. As this is really meant to be the record of a spiritualistic experience which came, if not precisely to Captain John's himself, at any rate to his ship, there is no use in recording the other events of the passage out. It was an ordinary passage. The crew was an ordinary crew. The weather was of the usual kind. The black mate's quiet, sedate method of going to work had given a sober tone to the lift of the ship. Even in gales of wind, everything went on quietly somehow. There was only one severe blow which made things fairly lively for all hands for the full four and twenty hours. That was off the coast of Africa, after passing the Cape of Good Hope. At the very height of it, several heavy seas were shipped with no serious results. But there was a considerable smashing of breakable objects in the pantry and in the staterooms. Mr. Bunter, who was so greatly respected on board, found himself treated scurvily by the Southern Ocean, which, bursting open the door of his room like a ruffianly burglar, carried off several useful things and made all the others extremely wet. Later on the same day, the Southern Ocean caused the sapphire to lurch over in such an unrestrained fashion that the two drawers fitted under Mr. Bunter's sleeping berth flew out altogether, spilling all their contents. Though they ought, of course, to have been locked, and Mr. Bunter had only to thank himself for what had happened. He ought to have turned the key on each before going out on deck. His consternation was very great. The steward, who was paddling about all the time with swabs, trying to dry out the flooded cuddy, heard him exclaim, Hello! in a startled and dismayed tone. In the midst of his work, the steward felt a sympathetic concern for the mate's distress. Captain Johns was secretly glad when he heard of the damage. He was indeed afraid of his chief mate, as the sea pilot had ventured to foretell, and afraid of him for the very reason the sea pilot had put forward as likely. Captain Johns, therefore, would have liked very much to hold that black mate of his at his mercy in some way or other, but the man was irreproachable, as near absolute perfect as could be, and Captain Johns was much annoyed, and at the same time congratulated himself on the chief officer's efficiency. He made a great show of living sociably with him, on the principle that the more friendly you are with a man, the more easily you may catch him tripping, and also for the reason that he wanted to have somebody who would listen to his stories of manifestations apparitions, ghosts, and all the rest of the imbecile spook lore. He had it all at his fingers' ends, and he spun those ghostly yarns in a persistent, colorless voice, giving them a futile turn, peculiarly his own. 
I like to converse with my officers, he used to say. There are masters that hardly ever open their mouths from beginning to end of a voyage for fear of losing their dignity. What's that, after all, this bit of position a man holds? His sociability was mostly to be dreaded in the second dog watch because he was one of those men who grow lively towards the evening and the officer on duty was unable to find excuses for leaving the poop. Captain Johns would pop up the companion suddenly and sliding up in his creeping way to poor Bunter as he walked up and down would fire into him some spiritualistic proposition such as spirits, male and female, show a good deal of refinement in a general way, don't they? To which Bunter, holding his black whiskered head high, would mutter, I don't know. Ah, that's because you don't want to. You are the most obstinate, prejudiced man I've ever met, Mr. Bunter. I told you, you may have any book out of my bookcase. You may just go into my stateroom and help yourself to any volume. And if Bunter protested that he was too tired in his watches below to spare any time for reading, Captain Johns would smile nastily behind his back and remark that, of course, some people needed more sleep than others to keep themselves fit for their work. If Mr. Bunter was afraid of not keeping properly awake when on duty at night, that was another matter. But I think you borrowed a novel to read from the second mate the other day. A trashy pack of lies, Captain John sighed. I am afraid you are not a spiritually minded man, Mr. Bunter. That's what's the matter. Sometimes he would appear on deck in the middle of the night, looking very grotesque and bandy-legged in his sleeping suit. At that sight, the persecuted Bunter would wring his hand stealthily and break out into moisture all over his forehead. After standing sleepily by the binnacle, scratching himself in an unpleasant manner, Captain Johns was sure to start on some aspect or other of his only topic. He would, for instance, discourse on the improvement of morality to be expected from the establishment of general and close intercourse with the spirits of the departed. The spirits, Captain Johns thought, would consent to associate familiarly with the living if it were not for the unbelief of the great mass of mankind. He himself would not care to have anything to do with a crowd that would not believe in his, Captain John's, existence. Then why should a spirit? This was asking too much. He went on breathing hard by the binnacle and trying to reach round his shoulder blades, then with a thick, drowsy severity declared, Incredulity, sir, is the evil of the age. It rejected the evidence of Professor Cranks and of the journalist chap. It resisted the production of photographs. For Captain Johns believed firmly that certain spirits had been photographed. He had read something of it in the papers, and the idea of it having been done had got a tremendous hold on him, because his mind was not critical. Bunter said afterwards that nothing could be more weird then this little man, swathed in a sleeping suit three sizes too large for him, shuffling with excitement in the moonlight near the wheel and shaking his fist at the serene sea. Photographs, photographs, he would repeat, in a voice as creaky as a rusty hinge. The very helmsman, just behind him, got uneasy at that performance not being capable of understanding exactly what the old man was kicking up a row with the mate about. Then Johns, after calming down a bit, would begin again. The sensitized plate can't lie. No, sir. Nothing could be more funny than this ridiculous little man's conviction, his dogmatic tone. Bunter would go on swinging up and down the poop like a deliberate, dignified pendulum. He said not a word, but the poor fellow had not a trifle on his conscience, as you know. 
and to have imbecile ghosts ram down his throat like this on the top of his own worry nearly drove him crazy. He knew that on many occasions he was on the verge of lunacy because he could not help indulging in half delirious visions of Captain John's being picked up by the scruff of the neck and dropped over the taffrail into the ship's wake. The sort of thing no sane sailorman would think of doing to a cat or any other animal anyhow. He imagined him bobbing up a tiny black speck left far astern in the moonlit ocean. I don't think that even at the worst moments Mr. Bunter really desired to drown Captain Johns. I fancy that all his disordered imagination longed for was merely to stop the ghostly inanity of the skipper's talk. But all the same, it was a dangerous form of self-indulgence. Just picture to yourself that ship in the Indian Ocean on a clear tropical night, with her sails full and still, the watch on deck stowed away out of sight, and on her poop, flooded with moonlight, the stately black mate walking up and down with measured dignified steps, preserving an awful silence, and that grotesquely mean little figure in striped flannelette, alternately creaking and droning of personal intercourse beyond the grave. It makes me creepy all over to think of, and sometimes the folly of Captain John's would appear clothed in a sort of weird utilitarianism. How useful it would be if the spirits of the departed could be induced to take a practical interest in the affairs of the living. What a help, say, to the police, for instance, in the detection of crime. The number of murders, at any rate, would be considerably reduced, he guessed with an air of great sagacity. Then he would give way to grotesque discouragement. Where was the use of trying to communicate with people that had no faith? and more likely than not would scorn the offered information. Spirits had their feelings. They were all feelings in a way, but he was surprised at the forbearance shown towards murderers by their victims. That was the sort of apparition that no guilty man would dare to poo-poo, and perhaps the undiscovered murderers, whether believing or not, were haunted. They wouldn't be likely to boast about it, would they? For myself, he pursued, in a sort of vindictive, malevolent whine, if anybody murdered me, I would not let him forget it. I would wither him up. I would terrify him to death. The idea of his skipper's ghost terrifying anyone was so ludicrous that the black mate, little disposed to mirth as he was, could not help giving vent to a weary laugh. And this laugh, the only acknowledgment of a long and earnest discourse, offended Captain Johns. What's there to laugh at in this conceited manner, Mr. Bunter, he snarled. Supernatural visitations have terrified better men than you. Don't allow me enough soul to make a ghost of it. I think it was the nasty tone that caused Bunter to stop short and turn about. I shouldn't wonder, went on the angry fanatic of spiritism, if you weren't one of them people that take no more account of a man than if he were a beast. You would be capable, I don't doubt, to deny the possession of an immortal soul to your own father. And then Bunter being bored beyond endurance and also exasperated by the private worry, lost his self-possession. He walked up suddenly to Captain Johns and, stooping a little to look close into his face, said, in a low, even tone, You don't know what a man like me is capable of. Captain Johns threw his head back, but was too astonished to budge. Bunter resumed his walk and for a long time his measured footsteps in the low wash of the water alongside were the only sounds which troubled the silence brooding over the great waters. Then Captain Johns cleared his throat uneasily, and, after sidling 
away towards the companion for greater safety, plucked up enough courage to retreat upon an act of authority, raised the starboard clue of the mainsail, and lay the yards dead square, Mr. Bunter. Don't you see the wind is nearly right aft? Bunter at once answered, Ay, ay, sir though there was not the slightest necessity to touch the yards, and the wind was well out on the quarter. While he was executing the order, Captain Johns hung on the companion steps, growling to himself, walk this poop like an admiral and don't even notice when the yards want trimming, loud enough for the helmsman to overhear. Then he sunk slowly backwards out of the man's sight, and... When he reached the bottom of the stairs, he stood still and thought. He's an awful ruffian, with all his gentlemanly airs. No more gentlemen mates for me. Two nights afterwards, he was slumbering peacefully in his berth, when a heavy thumping just above his head, a well-understood signal that he was wanted on deck, made him leap out of bed, brought awake in a moment. What's up, he muttered, running out barefooted. On passing through the cabin, he glanced at the clock. It was the middle watch. What on earth can the mate want me for, he thought. Bolting out of the companion, he found a clear, dewy, moonlit night and a strong, steady breeze. He looked around wildly. There was no one on the poop except the helmsman, who addressed him at once. It was me, sir. I let go the wheel for a second to stamp over your head. I am afraid there's something wrong with the mate. Where's he got to? asked the captain sharply. The man, who was obviously nervous, said, The last I saw of him was as he fell down the port poop ladder. Fell down the port poop ladder? What did he do that for? What made him? I don't know, sir. He was walking the port side, then just as he turned towards me to come aft... You saw him? interrupted the captain. I did. I was looking at him, and I heard the crash, too. Something awful, like the mainmast going overboard. It was as if something had struck him. Captain Johns became very uneasy and alarmed. Come, he said sharply. Did anybody strike him? What did you see? Nothing, sir, so help me. There was nothing to see. He just gave a little sort of hello threw his hands before him, and over he went. Crash! I couldn't hear anything more, so I just let go the wheel for a second to call you up. You're scared, said Captain Johns. I am, sir, straight. Captain Johns stared at him. The silence of his ship driving on her way seemed to contain a danger, a mystery. He was reluctant to go and look for his mate himself in the shadows of the main deck. So quiet, so still. All he did was to advance to the break of the poop and call for the watch. As the sleepy men came trooping aft, he shouted to them fiercely, Look at the foot of the port poop ladder, some of you. See the mate lying there. Their startled exclamations told him immediately that they did see him. Somebody even screeched out emotionally, He's dead! Mr. Bunter was laid in his bunk, and when the lamp in his room was lit, he looked indeed as if he were dead, but it was obvious also that he was breathing yet. The steward had been roused out. The second mate called and sent on deck to look after the ship, and for an hour or so Captain Johns devoted himself silently to the restoring of consciousness. Mr. Bunter at last opened his eyes. But he could not speak. He was dazed and inert. The steward bandaged a nasty scalp wound, while Captain Johns held an additional light. They had to cut away a lot of Mr. Bunter's jet-black hair to make a good dressing. This done, and after gazing for a while at their patient, the two left the cabin. A rum go, the steward, said Captain Johns in the passage. Yes, sir. A sober man, that's right in his head, does not fall down a poop ladder like a sack of potatoes. The ship's as steady as a church. Yes, sir. Fit of some kind, I shouldn't wonder. Well, I should. He doesn't look as if he were subject to fits and giddiness. Why, the man's in the prime of life. 
I wouldn't have another kind of mate, not if I knew it. You don't think he has a private store of liquor, do you, eh? He seemed to me a bit strange in his manner several times lately. Off his feed, too, a bit, I noticed. Well, sir, if he ever had a bottle or two of grog in his cabin, that must have gone a long time ago. I saw him throw some broken glass overboard after the last gale we had, but that didn't amount to anything. Anyway, sir, you couldn't call Mr. Bunter a drinking man. No, conceded the captain reflectively, and the steward, locking the pantry door, tried to escape out of the passage, thinking he could manage to snatch an hour of sleep before it was time for him to turn out for the day. Captain Johns shook his head. There's some mystery there. There's special providence that he didn't crack his head like an eggshell on the quarter-deck mooring bits, sir. The men tell me he couldn't have missed them by more than an inch, and the steward vanished skillfully. Captain John spent the rest of the night and the whole of the ensuing day between his own room and that of the mate. In his own room he sat with his open eyes reposing on his knees, his lips pursed up, and the horizontal furrows of his forehead marked very heavily. Now and then, raising his arm by a slow, as if cautious, movement, he scratched lightly the top of his bald head. In the mate's room he stood for long periods of time with his hand to his lips, gazing at the half-conscious man. For three days Mr. Bunter did not say a single word. He looked at people sensibly enough, but did not seem to be able to hear any questions put to him. They cut off some more of his hair, swathed his head in wet cloths. He took some nourishment, and was made as comfortable as possible. At dinner on the third day, the second mate remarked to the captain in connection with the affair, These half-round brass plates on the steps of the poop ladders are beastly dangerous things. Are they, retorted Captain John sourly. It takes more than a brass plate to account for an able-bodied man crashing down in this fashion like a felled ox. The second mate was impressed by that view. There was something in that, he thought. And the weather fine, everything dry, and the ship going along as steady as a church, pursued Captain Johns gruffly. As Captain Johns continued to look extremely sour, the second mate did not open his lips any more during the dinner. Captain Johns was annoyed and hurt by an innocent remark, because the fitting of the aforesaid brass plates had been done at his suggestion only the voyage before, in order to smarten up the appearance of the poop ladders. On the fourth day, Mr. Bunter looked decidedly better. Very languid yet, of course. But he heard and understood what was said to him, and even could say a few words in a feeble voice. Captain Johns, coming in, contemplated him attentively, without much visible sympathy. Well, can you give us your account of this accident, Mr. Bunter? Bunter moved slightly his bandaged head and fixed his cold blue stare on Captain Johns' face, as if taking stock and appraising the value of every feature, the perplexed forehead, the credulous eyes, the inane droop of the mouth, and he gazed so long that Captain Johns grew restive and looked over his shoulder at the door. No accident, breathed out Buncher in a peculiar tone. You don't mean to say that you've got the falling sickness, said Captain Johns. How would you call it signing as chief mate of a clipper with a thing like that on you. Bunner answered only by a sinister look. The skipper shuffled his feet a little. Well, what made you have that tumble, then? Bunter raised himself a little, and looking straight into Captain John's eyes, said in a very distinct whisper, You were right. He fell back and closed his eyes. Not a word more could Captain John's get out of him and the steward coming into the cabin, the skipper withdrew. But that very night, unobserved, Captain Johns, opening the door cautiously, 
entered again the, the mate's cabin. He could wait no longer. The suppressed eagerness, the excitement expressed in all his mean, creeping little person did not escape the chief mate, who was lying awake, looking frightfully pulled down and perfectly impassive. You are coming to gloat over me, I suppose, said Bunter without moving and yet making a palpable hit. 